Today, we have gathered some of our members to ask them questions about how our amazing pastors influence their lives. Describe Pastor Todd in three words. Loyal, integrity, and friendly. Describe Pastor Vinny in three words. Prophetic, wisdom, and friendly. Three words that you would use to best describe Pastor Michelle. Compassionate, confident, and empathetic. Three words that describe Pastor Gabe. Weird, mm -hmm. funny, okay, and loyal. Mm. Three words that best describe Pastor Maria. Loving, nurturing, and dedicated. Three words that best describe Pastor Ruthie. Loving, caring, and gentle. Three words that best describe Pastor Shane. Patient, faithful, and guiding. Three words that best describe Pastor Tanya. Beautiful, sweet, and wise. Three words that would best describe Pastor Ray. Dedicated, he's family oriented, and he's inspirational. Three words that you would use to best describe Pastor Sarah. Patient, kind, and gentle. Three words that would best describe Pastor Ernesto. Pastor Ernesto is faithful, solid, and loving. Three words that would best describe Pastor Greg. Gentle, kind, and faithful. Three words that would best describe Pastor Stephanie. Wise, intelligent, and cheesy and corny. <laughs> what three words would you use to best describe Pastor Megan? Determined, she's inspiring, and she's trustworthy. Three words that best describe Pastor Juan. Loving, genuine, real. Three words that would best describe Pastor Asanet. She is resilient, she is funny, and she is loving. Three words that you would use to best describe Pastor Jonathan. Caring, focused, and real. How has Pastor Todd helped you grow in your faith? Well, he has taught me that consistency is very important to grow our faith. How has Pastor Vinny helped you grow in your faith? His trust in God, uh, I've seen him start his business from nothing to working in a barbershop in his garage to now what he has now. He has a couple barbershops. Um, so I've seen him through his whole process, his whole growth process. And that, that's encouraged me a lot to do better at what I do. How would you say she has helped you grow in your faith with the Lord? We have this scrapbook that we share with each other. And in the book, we just really talk about God. And she just really nailed it in my head that it's not about me. And it's more about how uncomfortable am I willing to get for Jesus. And how has he helped you grow in your faith? I guess we, we have those tough conversations a lot. It definitely helped me uh, with being more like Christ in a sense, because I was real abrasive. And then him coming back as a pastor and being like, hey, maybe, you know, approach this this way. Funny enough, he was the person that I had the most com tough conversations with. So yeah, that for sure. How has Pastor Mariana helped you grow in your faith? Well, we did a book and it really helped me realize that I don't have to keep coming back to the same sin over and over again because I've been forgiven. How would you say she has helped you through your faith? Just watching how she represents God's love and his compassion and to live out my faith by the way I see her represent his kindness and just how she's so caring for others. Can you tell me how Pastor Shane has helped you grow in your faith with the Lord? Uh, he's been an example of what a God-loving and God-fearing man is. So him being that, that pillar is what show me what I can be as a husband one day. How would you say Pastor Tanya has helped you grow further in your faith with the Lord? The way she developed like a personal relationship with me made me just feel more welcome and comfortable coming. And that was the start of everything, so. How has Pastor Ray helped you further your faith in the Lord? He had a huge impact it's, as far as me in my walk with the, with the Lord. You know, he's one of the first person in get rap to invite me to a church event that actually felt authentic to me at the time, and that really opened the gate for me as far as my walk. How would you say she has helped you grow in your relationship with the Lord? Definitely on the patience part and uh, that that gentleness, she just kind of takes people in and uh, just walks with them uh, in such a gent gentle and loving way that um, it really leaves space and leaves room for growth and maturity. And how has he helped you further your faith and relationship with the Lord? Pastor Ernesto has shared hard truths with me whenever he would tell me what I needed to hear and not what I wanted to hear. How has Pastor Greg helped you further your relationship with the Lord? That the Lord continues to move through the things that we've gone through. The Lord 
shows us that other people go through things, but the Lord still moves in their life. How has Pastor Stephanie helped you further your relationship with the Lord? She helped me through a difficult time, and she was basically telling me, like, if you really want to make that change, make it today, right now, because if you keep saying you're going to make it another day, you're just going to keep prolonging it. She encouraged me to read my Bible more. She gave me tools to help me with my walk with Christ, with my family, and major like my mindset especially. How has Pastor Megan helped you further your relationship with the Lord? Simply by the way that she lives her life. Anytime I watch her being faithful in her ministry, she's always trusting the Lord and she's always leaning on Him for wisdom. And just having that example has truly helped me grow. And can you tell me how Pastor Juan has helped you further your relationship and faith with the Lord? Because of his genuineness that allowed me to understand who I was called to be, a child of God. And can you tell me in a way that she has helped you grow your relationship with the Lord? Um, by the way that she's loved me, um, just the way she embraces me, it's like the love of the Father. Can you tell me how Pastor Jonathan has helped you grow your relationship further with the Lord? By keeping me accountable of what I want, calling me all the time, hey, what you doing? Are you reading? How are you? But, but no, like, how are you? <laughs> Do you have any words of encouragement or a message to tell Pastor Todd? Never change, never give up, be who you are. Any words of encouragement you would like to give Pastor Vinny? Pastor Vinny, I uh, just want to thank you for all that you've done for me and my family. Uh, you've been a big part of our, our lives, and um, I know that you've been there for me in the good times and the bad times, and um, I just pray that God keeps uh, you know speaking to you and you keep being obedient to Him. Do you have a message or any words of encouragement for Pastor Michelle? I just want to say thank you for getting the time to know me and my family, and it really touched my heart, and I can't wait to see where our relationship grows. Any words of encouragement for Pastor Gabe? Man, just keep your head up and keep pushing, bro. That's really it. I know sometimes a really good example of how to lean on Christ in those moments, for sure. Is there a message or any words of encouragement you would like to tell Pastor Mariano? You're an amazing pastor. I love you. You're great. I can't think of anyone else who would be in that leadership role for me. Any words of encouragement or a message to Pastor Ruby? Keep shining your light. You have inspired many lives. Thank you for just how genuinely you have loved me. We're blessed to have you in our lives and we love you. Do you have a message or words of encouragement for Pastor Shane? Thank you for being uh, the pillar to my mother. Uh, thank you for showing me an example of what a, a, a husband is. Uh, I hope to example you one day. Do you have a message or words of encouragement for Pastor Tanya? Well, Pastor Tanya, you and your gifts are incredibly special. And thank you for all you do for the kingdom. And that's it. Love you. <laughs> do you have a message or any words of encouragement for Pastor Sarah? Absolutely. Um, you are such a blessing in so many ways, whether you're in this space or out of it. You definitely lead with love. And so uh, the best way that I can say thank you is to do that for everyone that I encounter. So I love you and I appreciate you. And lastly, do you have any words of encouragement or a message to Pastor Ray? Continue doing what he's doing because it, like I said, it made a huge impact on my life. And I don't know if he knows that it did, but I feel like if he continues to do it, you never know what doors. Any message or words of encouragement for Pastor Ernesto? Keep advancing the kingdom, keep pouring into others, and I just thank you for, for everything that you've done for me and my family. Any words of encouragement for Pastor Greg? And the message is about faith and for him to continue to be faithful so that the Lord can continue moving his life and don't get discouraged. Just keep moving on, keep doing what you're doing because we love you. And lastly, do you have a message or any words of encouragement for him? Um, I think I would say thank you for all the sacrifices that you made seen and unseen. Thank you for loving beyond measures and just thank you for being who you are and who God's called you to be. Any words of encouragement you would like to give to Pastor Stephanie? Thank you for pouring your love into children's, to youth, to the big church house and everything, especially to my family. We love spending time with you, laughing with you, and I'm so glad that I get to call you part of my family. What you do does not go unnoticed, and I believe that there's so much blessings coming your way for the things that you have done and the things that you are doing today, and I just want to say love you. 
Do you have a message or words of encouragement for Pastor Megan? I'm so incredibly grateful to have her in my life, being able to learn from you and grow from you. I know that God has done many mighty things in your life and he has so much more to do and I just can't wait to see it. And lastly, do you have a message or any words of encouragement for Pastor Jonathan? I would say I love you, man. Thank you for holding me accountable and pushing me in ways that sometimes annoy me, but I know it helps in the long run because you just love me and that's what real friends do, real brothers do, push each other. And lastly, is there a message or any words of encouragement you would like to tell Pastor Juan? I love you. All right, thank you. How has Pastor Greg helped you further your relationship with the Lord? Um. <laughs> you got distracted. You you're the best you're the best, uh, man, how do I explain it? You're, you're, you're the best. I'm gonna have to redo it. That was funny. Uh, thanks. Thanks guys. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you guys very, very much. And so uh, well, we're gonna do one more round of applause, alright, but not for me. Um I, I think it's important to acknowledge the fact that, you know, I was telling the service before that a teacher is only as good as a student. And so the reality is that we're only who we are because you guys have made a decision in your heart to follow Jesus and have decided to call this your home church. And because we have an incredible, the people God has called, I feel like he called us all to this little spot and uh, pastors, all the pastors, the leaders, the pastors' wives, the pastors' husbands, Right? All of this play intricate parts in who we are. So I want you guys to give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> yep. Thank you guys. Thank you for the honor. It's a privilege. You guys have a seat. If you were clapping at home, thank you. <laughs> and so um, we have a new sermon series um, called We Make Christ Known by the Way We Love everywhere we go and uh, I would add like if you take notes I would put and it starts at home because all of these uh, weeks we'll be teaching and preaching based on uh, making Christ known by the way we love and uh, I just think that we've done a bad job at even thinking well sometimes people are teaching it right it's just people don't want to listen and so my my hope is that you would understand John 13, 34, and 35. That's the verse we're going to come out of today. It's the scripture passage, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the context of what was going on in that chapter. And then hopefully, we can leave here understanding this, and we could be brighter in a lost and dying world. Amen? Amen. All right, everybody say, make Christ known. Make Christ known. By, the way we love. By the way we love. Everywhere we go. And then look at your neighbor and say, and it starts at home. Ooh, some of y'all were nervous to look to the side. <laughs> so John 13, 34, and 35 reads like this. I give you a new command. You could underline that. Love one another. Underline that. Just as I have loved you, put about two lines in a circle around that thing. 
You are also to love one another. By this, everybody say by this. By this. Woo, this must be important. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. As believers, we're called to be the hands and feet of Jesus, and this is accomplished by how we love one another. Uh, today, we're going to focus on making Christ known by the way we love everywhere we go. See, the context of John chapter 13 is Jesus' final teaching to his disciples before he gets arrested. Man, you got to read the Bible. I'm telling you, when you read the Bible, this is like a, a novella. This is like a novella. Because so before he gets arrested, you know, it would have been like in Juan or Ernesto, we would have all been in that story. In these Jesus moments, he's preparing them because he's about to depart. He just finished washing the disciples' feet, which you see an act of humility and service there. And now he's giving them a new command. He says, a new command I give you. Was it a new command because they had never heard about loving one another? Verse 34, a new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. You must love one another. Now you got to think, this is probably a very emotional time for Jesus. Why? I mean, think about it. He's revealing to his disciples that he's about to get betrayed. So they, they're dialoguing. They're having this conversation. And he's like, hey, you know, one of you is about to betray me. And then he's telling them that, hey, my time is limited with y'all. And come on, you guys are, you guys been hanging out every day. And he's like, yeah, my time is limited with y'all. And then he chooses this precious moment. He chooses this final word, right? When we think about leaving a legacy, sometimes we think, I got to leave a legacy for my children. And we think houses and cars or finances, right? Bank accounts. And he chooses in that final moment to leave a legacy of this one word we call love. So think about it. Out of everything he could leave them, he leaves them this word, love. Why is the command new? Because let me tell you something. This wasn't a new idea. Leviticus 19.18 in the Old Testament said, love your neighbor as yourself. That was like the standard back then, right? Even when Jesus talks to the Pharisees in the New Testament, he tells them, hey, two commands. And the second one, first one was to love God. The second one was to love people, to love your neighbor as yourself. And I'm always thinking that the only reason he said that is because we're really selfish and we know how to love us like we, everything's about us outside of Jesus. And so he gives them a new standard to live by, right? I, I hear it a lot. You know, people read that verse and they go, man, that's why you got to do you first. <laughs> and I'm like, man, that's selfish. See, because the thought is that God, when you love God, he takes care of you. Like when, when you have a relationship with God, there's no way that, you don't, that you're not taken care of. But if you start thinking like, I got to do me first, then God becomes like second or third and then it's you first. It doesn't matter what you say. That's why he put that one as the first one. We will jack that up even if we read it. We will mess it up. So he gives us a new standard. He said, this is how you're going to love as I have loved you. Jesus is calling for a love that goes beyond our human expectation, beyond our cultural norms. The question this morning is, are we reflecting Christ's love in our daily lives? You say, man, how, how is this love possible? As Christians, our identity is rooted in Christ, and His love should naturally overflow out of you being in Christ. 1 John 4, 19 says, we love because He loved us first. So when you receive that kind of love that we're going to talk about today, it's just an overflow out of those things. See, we, when we're patient with those who frustrate us, we make Christ known. When we're generous with our time and our resources to those in need, we make Christ known. When we forgive those who hurt us, even when it's hard, we make Christ known. See, we live in a society today that we think that we make Christ known by the way we put a post on social media. We think that we make Christ known by the way we go to conferences or hat or shirt. And even though a hat and a shirt is kind of cool and fly, the reality is that that's not how you make Christ known. It's when you're patient, you make Christ known. When you're generous, you make Christ known. When you forgive someone, you make Christ known. The standard of love is as I have loved you. 
This is the heart of the command. Hence, henceforth, remember this word, love. Remember this word, command. It's not like he's like, hey, if you want to. This is a command. And then he, in this command, he says, as I have loved you. So how did Jesus love? That's probably the question. That, that is probably the question. Because he's, if he's saying, love someone else as I have loved you, then the, the question today is, how did Jesus love? So the first thing we see is he loved sacrificially. Jesus was categorized by sacrifice. He laid his life down for his friends. And not just his friends, but for all humanity. And now when you got it all together, he laid his life down for you before you even walked into the church. He laid his life down for you before you were like talking in tongues. Before you read your Bible. That's, that's the part that's hard to understand. Because we, if we're to love like Jesus, then we're to see like Jesus too, right? Because the cross is the ultimate expression of love. I hear people talk about, I die daily. It's like we get really good at being around things and we actually say them. But are, if you was to ask the closest people to you, do you exhibit that? Not do you say it. Because if you remember, the Pharisees said it all the time. Their hearts weren't in it though, but their mouthpiece was good. They could talk about God. They could fast. They could pray. They did all those things. They just, they, they, I feel like Jesus in, inwardly already knew what the cross was. That's how he lived his life. The cross is the ultimate expression of, our, of his love. This love, we, would, we only know it because we've seen him die at the cross. His love had no boundaries. See, Christ's love knows no limits. His love crossed every boundary, whether it was cultural, social, religious. He touched lepers. He ate with tax collectors and spoke with the Samaritan woman at the well. His love was not restricted to who looked like him or believed like him and his followers. Our love must also break through the thing that divides people. We're called to be peacemakers. We're called to be bridge builders. We're called to reconcile. And so it's interesting that we're often divided by race, politics, economics, religion, even when, right now, we're about to, look, and I think everybody should go vote. Everybody should vote. And you should vote the Bible. You should vote the Bible. Read your Bible. See, the, the thing that's interesting to me is even in that, let me tell you. I have a friend who voted, and this is going to be beyond uh, what's popular. Right? Because, because you know, in, in time, let me tell you something. I had a friend who voted, uh, I thought, a little bit crazy. Didn't vote the Bible the last four years ago. And this person was a good friend. And I never told them they were going to hell. I didn't tell them they were a Christian. Now you might think, well, what? No, we got to stand for truth. I, I hear you. But if I would have just condemned them to hell, we might have not been friends anymore. The truth was I took my time. And I applied 2 Timothy. I was patient, able to teach. Now, I did joke with them because it was my friend. So I joked with them a lot. Like, wow, I can't believe you just messed up our country. <laughs> I joked with them a lot, you know. But the reality is, little by little, I kept explaining stuff. And I was like, not, not people, just, hey, what do you think about this? Hey, what do you think about this? Hey, why this? We'll say, well, it's, you know, the... Just all kinds of stuff. And at some point, now she's voting Bible. Because I get it. I get it. I get it. I, I want you to understand something. Love is not affirming sin. But love is also patient. Love is also kind. It's not rude. It doesn't puff itself up. So don't be rude. Because that's not love. Because you could be honest and tell the truth and not be rude. Right? And I understand because I, I, I believe that this should be a man and a woman. 
and that they should get married, have babies, call it a family, lead them the way Christ was the church. I believe that. But I also, you know, it's like we love to like transgender. Yeah, I don't believe that a child should make a decision in cutting their private part. I, I think that's crazy, demonic. But I just don't shun them. If I'm that passionate about it, then I'm going to find somebody to dialogue with. They don't want to listen. They will if you deliver it in a way that's kind, patient, loving. If you want to try to understand them. Right? Like we love talking about that stuff, but we don't want to talk about shacking. We don't want to talk about you're sexually immoral and you have sex every weekend and you're not married. We don't want to talk about your gossiping tongue. We don't want to talk about how you still talk about the people that you hang out with and you say you love. We don't want to talk about going and still getting high on the weekends. Like, we don't want to talk about that stuff because that ain't that big. But just as much as I, w- I would go and try to speak to you in a matter of whatever it is sin in your life. We don't want to talk about you only wanting a platform. Because this is the funny part when everybody's like, oh, you know, like, oh, Pat, you know, this, this right here. Oh, man, this is the icing on the cake, baby. This is like the, yeah, I get to preach. This thing was, you want senior pastor. You never can say something right because everybody's got something to say about what you say. Right? I mean, you got to go through seasons that are difficult. You got to figure everything out. For, it seems like you got to figure everything. You ain't God, but you feel like it sometimes because you got to figure out everything for everybody else because they actually don't want to read their Bible, pray, and stuff. So you catch the lashes for it. And it's like, bro, if you would read and actually be quick to, like the verse last week, everything I'm telling you today should be in your heart so that when you go out, you're quick to listen. And then you do it. And then, oh my God, my life changed. We're called, we're called to love everywhere we go, not just in church, but in the marketplace, in schools, in our neighborhoods, even online. Even online. I, I, I'm telling you, there's so, I have story after story. Story after story. I had a guy that, homosexual lifestyle, and pretty much still conversate with them every now and then when the opportunity presents itself. And I get it. I get it, because something that, I get the dislikes, right? Because sometimes when we see that community, right, every now and then there's some that I feel like do too much. I'm saying like my wife, and I get it, you get irritated, right? Like you, you go to a restaurant and you're going to get led to a table and they're like, follow me. <laughs> and, you're, and, and you're just like, I mean, like in my mind, I'm like, my wife ain't even like that. <laughs> like my wife doesn't do that. I'm not saying that for fun. I'm saying it brings that little irritation and you're like, man, you're doing, like if I was their friend, like we just kicked it, I'd be like, you're doing too much. <laughs> like I get that's your view right now, but you're doing way too much. Like, like, Ruthie ain't like, come on, like, 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 so I get the irritation, but in that irritation, you cannot forget the command to love. You cannot forget because a person is voting different. You say, because here's the thing. Now, this is, oh, this is not going to be popular. Oh, man. I, I, but I, I mean, I just like going. Okay, so sometimes we're like, it, it, <laughs> like, everybody like, say it. <laughs> because sometimes it's like, I see the, the theme, right? If. If you are voting this way, then you're not a Christian and you're going to hell. That's a lie from the pits of hell. And let me tell you why. Now, I'm not telling you to go vote that way because obviously we vote the Bible. Man, woman, you don't get, just think the Bible. Yeah. And you're voting the, the, of the lesser two evils pretty much. But you still got to vote. Just think of the last four years what has happened. But here's the thing. We say that and say, okay, let's go with that terminology. So, do I send you to hell and you're not a Christian because you still have a lot of anger and you cuss people out? But maybe you haven't gotten to that thought yet. Maybe nobody has presented truth to you. All they do is yell at you with a sign. Maybe nobody has sat down with you and actually explained to you why your thinking is is wrong. We don't do that. We just want to do videos. We want to do videos. Go talk to some of these people. 
Like, go find somebody that gets high. Like, like the whole soul winning thing, too. It's like, it's like uh, oh, I'm a soul winner. Because, because, and this is, listen, I've said it before. But the more I read the scriptures, we think that I won souls because we had a big event outside. 5,000 people came and they raised their hand and were like, I'm a soul winner. I don't think that's accurate. I think in that crowd, if you have won the mind, will, and emotions of somebody, you actually won their soul. So if I sit with you long enough and I get you to see Jesus is thinking, I don't want your soul. And then there's a progressive state of changing, right? I got to show you in a way that you can't do this on your own. That you got to be totally dependent upon Jesus. That, hey, I used to, because that means you would have, I mean, there was a lot of people that counted me out. I'm so glad that God was patient with me. I'm so glad that, I'm glad that God took the time to actually talk to me and send somebody that would talk to me. Are you with me? I mean, we see him in humility. We see him doing things in humility. We see him washing the disciples' feet. And listen to me. If you read John uh, 13... The context of that, because, right? I mean, think about it. We've all done this. We go, and we read that, and we go wash a foot. I don't think that that's what he's actually saying. I think that that was an example on how to love. I think that what he was saying was, hey, no matter, you call me teacher, and you call me Lord, and yes, that's true, but because of that, I can come down, and nothing is ever beneath me to actually serve you. Those are for my people that want titles and platforms. You say you don't, but you get bent out of shape. You don't want to celebrate people. You don't want to clean toilets anymore, because now you're too, like, no. He's showing you that, hey, no matter what, I can come down and serve you. I always say it starts at home. Because if you can't do that at home, we are not going to do that at church. Hear me. You got to hear me. It starts at home. That's where you practice that. And then when you come here, you do it here. We're going to change a lost and dying world because we get this right here, here. Before here, home. Why? Because if you're not doing it at home and you're just doing it here, you're wearing your mask. It's your church mask. Well, I'm just going to be like this for five minutes. But if you know me long enough, then you're going to see my attitude. And don't cross me because I'm going to cut you off. And it's like, that ain't Christ. That's the hood. Hey, but I want things to change. Well, then you can't do it the way you did it before. Can I get an amen? amen? He did it unconditionally. Jesus loved without partiality or condition. He loved Judas, even though Judas was going to read that whole chapter. He loved Judas. That was just good stuff. He wasn't affirming the fact that he was a thief, but he loved them and served them. Hey, we could have said that about Judas. Judas could have never said something bad about Jesus. Every time he got alone, he probably thought, man, I'm messing up. He loved Peter, knowing Peter would deny him three times. Isn't this wild that he, you know, for us, it usually happens, and then we're like, oh, right? Imagine pre-knowing. Imagine, y'all ain't ain't here today. Imagine him, imagine you pre-knowing they're going to do you dirty. Now, you kind of go with it, and they're like, praise the Lord, brother, and then, bam, they hit you in the back of the head. But imagine pre-knowing, like, I know you're going to do me wrong, but I'm going to love you anyway. It's because we confuse the word love with affirming sin. That's not it. Oh, you know, in parenting, that's, oh, that's, I see it all the time. Oh, you know, I love him. I'm like, you're killing him. Like, you, you got to give them the truth and grace. You can't just let them do whatever. That's not love. And so listen, this guy, he knows. Hey, he's loving. You know why he's loving? Because that's in his nature, not our behavior. That's in his nature, not our behavior. 
In other words, when you're in Christ, when I love people, I'm loving people out of my position in Christ. I am actually doing my part despite what you do. Oh, it, it ain't easy. This is why they call it dying. But when you no longer live, Christ lives in you by faith, then woo. I'm actually thinking I'm doing my part. It works at home. It works here. Sometimes you miss it, but you go back and make it right. It means loving those who are difficult, loving in times of conflict, loving those who oppose us. Come on, you're supposed to be a witness to the world. Verse 35, by this. Everybody say, by this. By this. You want to put three lines under by this. You want to circle by this. You want to put an arrow by this. You want to put a smiley face by this. Did I, did I make the point? Why? Because by this. It sounds so, I don't know how that hits you. When I read by this, I have it in bold, black, big, underlined. Why? Because it's letting me know by this. See, y'all think it's by this. Y'all think it's by this. Y'all think it's by this. If they fall, they will know Christ. Y'all think it's by whatever you think it's by. <laughs> no, no. By this. Everybody say, by this. this. Everybody shake your neighbor and say, by this. this. Everybody point at somebody and go, by this. By this. this. Everybody point at Oscar, by this. this. Man, everybody knows you. Everybody pointed. (laughs) Somebody at home was like, he's over there. (laughs) Everyone. I can't even get out of that. I can't get out of that line, Pastor Todd. By this, everyone. Few people. A couple people in the back. Somewhere in a conference. At your job. At your family. Everyone. Everywhere. Because everywhere there's an everyone. But at home, they cannot not see it and then you do it at work. Or they don't see it at home, they don't see it at church, but then at work you're super Christian. That makes no sense. By this, everyone, by this, by this, everyone, will know that you are my disciples. Because they don't have that verse right there, right? It's just Jesus. Could you imagine sitting there and he goes, by this, everyone will know that you're my disciples. And then he pauses. By what? Right? Because we're reading it. So imagine not reading it. He stops there. By this, everyone will know. And some, by the way we teach, brother, at the synagogue, brother by the way we fast and pray come on be real you never read this text before think about some of the things you do you already know if you sit in a group in your hangout and every time a question comes you just come with a three-point theological sermon and you never let that question go through you then you think that you're known by the way you teach people that's the truth Hangouts are going to be totally different this week. (laughs) But that's the goal, right? It's to read the Word and let it filter through you, refine you. Right? I give someone an assignment. I told them, hey, (laughs) James chapter 1. So they gave me the homework. It was incredible. Bible college student. I'm like, wow, this is amazing. But it wasn't what I asked. 
I was like, give me James chapter 1 in your life. What's your various trial? What are you being quick to listen to? What are you doubting? <laughs> then you get the verse. Because now you live it out. It's like talking about a diet plan that you never do. <laughs> oh, well, don't want to point at Oscar right now. <laughs> If you love one another, is how you will be known. That's how you will make Christ known. By your patience, your kindness, your joy. And all those things happen in difficult circumstances. You serve one another in humility. This is how you live it out. Even when, thing, when, when things go unnoticed or unappreciated. Come on, man, be honest. Hey, they didn't say, they didn't tell me it was a good job. So now you're just looking for that. Like, that's the truth. Unappreciated. Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. We wash another's feet by offering help, support, and service to those in need. There should never be people that And I'm not talking about, because obviously we're all going to make mistakes, and there's learning curves from all that stuff, right? But at some point, you know, because you, you, you get it, there's people that I know that have been in church their whole life, they're still angry, still impatient. And I'm like, and they're like, you know, brother, God's working on me. I'm like, how long, though? <laughs> like, for how long, though? I got to saved a few years ago. I say in 2000, some people are like, I've been saved since 19. I'm like, and you're still impatient? Like, you're still angry and bitter? Like, you still don't know how to talk to somebody? Well, I, I, I just don't know how to do it. Well, didn't you just, just do it? <laughs> it's going to come out beat up in the beginning. Then it's going to get better. What are you waiting for? Jesus to grab you by the thing? Well, now I, I'm going to... It's like, no, like, like, like that's not accurate. You don't tithe on everything. You tithe in the forefront. You pray in the forefront. You just don't pray. You, you, you do all these things by faith. You're patient by faith. You think that doesn't come up? You're acting like, come on, man. man I think one of these weeks I'm going to come in with the fitted and everything. Walk like this. You think that's what I came out of? You think I don't get the feelings? You think I don't see myself running over people? <laughs> I, I just tie a captive. That's what the Bible says, right? And I become patient. And if I miss it, I go, my bad. Should have been a little more patient. And then I'm always trying to do those things in the forefront. I'm not doing it because, I mean, after 10,000 apologies, you're manipulating. That means you don't want to change. You just want me to carry the weight of whatever you want to do. You got to forgive one another. Like, loving like Jesus means you're forgiving. Do you remember what he said when they nailed him to the cross? That's one of the hardest things Jesus ever had to demonstrate was forgiveness. Come on, you're getting nailed to the cross. He says, Father, forgive them, for they not know what they do. That was a, a life-changing revelation for me. Life-changing. Why? That one little part. Well, some of you are trying to remember the whole entire thing. I'm just catching one little part, and it's making sense to me, right? For they not know. We get mad with people because you think they only know what they've been taught to know. They only vote by what they've been taught to know. They only, it's just usually a traumatic thing, cultural thing. Any of those things is what they've learned. We weren't taught to be patient. We weren't taught to be gentle. We weren't taught to have joy. We thought we had to go to things so we could find joy. We thought joy was on, I wanted to do a series, it was going to be called Friday Nights on Netflix. 
It's going to be these stories of people that thought Friday night was a highlight, but it was messed them up. It's Friday. You got taught that stuff. I mean, they even made a movie called Friday. Part one, part two. But it is because you're getting taught that that's what brings joy. And you, and you eat it up, <clears throat> apple after apple. You mad at Adam because they, they bit the apple. You about at 18 apples. You got four bags of apples. <laughs> they still, you're still like TikToking. You're like, you, your whole theology is TikTok. You repeat what everybody else says. And the reality is that at some point that has to become real to you so that when, see, I could preach this all day long. I could preach to, I could find big words. I can start getting excited. Everybody gets excited. It's when I leave here and you get me all. (laughs) Do I go, hey, brother, I love you. (laughs) Am I patient with you? Colossians 3.13. It talks about bearing with one another which means to put up with somebody. <laughs> Some of y'all, don't, look to, don't look at your neighbor. Don't look at your neighbor. Just focus, focus. You're like... If it says, bear with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a grievance against another, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. Man, to, oh. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, just as the Lord, just as the Lord has loved you, just as the Lord has forgiven. Maybe you haven't received it. Maybe you forgot how crazy you were and how much forgiveness you needed last year, five years ago, tomorrow. Come on. <laughs> I'll preach over here because no, I'm joking. <laughs> Just as the Lord. I, I was thinking about this in the, in the, when I preached this in the first service. I thought about this. What if tomorrow God was going to treat you the way you treat people? He was going to love you the way you love people. And He was going to forgive you based on the way you forgave people. What would this week be like for you? He started to pull all the things you don't want to look at. He's like, that right there, that's how I'm going to treat you on that. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Man, sacrificially, in humility, unconditionally. You don't have to do nothing. Now, I want to reciprocate it, obviously. But just because I'm loved, I mean, that's my thing. And you've heard me say it a billion times. See, when I, when I do things based upon his perfection, then the overflow is I'm going to do it for you, regardless of how you are with me. You practice that for a couple years, it's like building a muscle. And so I'm there to please. Oh, no man, nothing but to but to love him. Oh, so then all you owe him is to be patient, kind, sacrificial. That's what you're saying. See, again, we use that. We just think of like boys to men love. Some of the younger people are like, boys to men. I just call some young folks. They're like, To the end of the road. Oh, they go, oh, oh. <laughs> Seen it on TikTok. <laughs> I, I want to read you a verse. And, and you know, this wasn't even, I, I don't know, this wasn't part of the message, but, but I'm bringing it in because you have to understand that the mark of a true disciple is how you love. Like, like that's the mark. Everything else is gifting 
that you develop. But that's not the mark of you being a disciple. You can be really good at that and not make Christ known. And so that's the problem. We all, you know, the Apostle Paul says, follow me. Follow my example as I follow Christ. And me and the men, we were talking about that, I think last week or something. And uh, I was like, man, he's saying, look, I'm going to follow Christ. You follow me. And I'm going to be the example. I'm going to reflect. I'm not Jesus. But I'm going to reflect Jesus. Why? So you can know Jesus. Some of you think that church or whatever else, is, you're basically being a bad representative. I tell guys all the time, when they're going to date girls, and I know they're in Christ, or at least they were until they start dating, and then they go cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. I tell them, like, don't be a bad witness, bro. My question always is, is Ruthie and Josh seeing Jesus? Is the office, everybody who's with me every day, my question is always, are they seeing Jesus? Am I being a good representation? I, and Pastor Todd, I tell you, just as much as he opens, sometimes I open with him, and I'm like, man, this, this, yeah. But even in that, I'm hoping they still see Jesus. I want to read you a verse because I want to show you love, but not in the way that you think it. And so Pastor Philip Mitchell, I believe is his last name, you know, he's a pastor over in, I think, Jersey. You know, we, we bound to meet, right, because of the Jersey thing. I think maybe Brooklyn. And, uh, you know, I like his messages. And um, he, he had mentioned 1 Corinthians 5.5. 5. And I looked at 1 Corinthians 5.5 5 because he mentioned it. And then I just want to show you something. Because you maybe would think this is mean. But this is love. And so to give you a little context, even though, you know, I just want to give you a little quick context. It's this, uh, 1 Corinthians 5.5. 5, he starts talking about uh, sexual immorality. Right? Because we're really good at looking at all the, um, you know, the drug addict, the alcohol, you know, the transgender, you know, all of these things, the homosexual. I'm thinking you got to add in there the prideful, the arrogant, the selfish ambition, which is called demonic, or the earthly wisdom that's also demonic, or you're the one that's having sex with multiple chicks in the church because you turned it into a club and you've dated like three, four people. Like, like hear me out. I understand stuff happens, but I also want you to understand that you got to put that in the same bracket. You can't be like, oh, they are horrible. You know, you've been watching porn in secret, and you're like, oh, they are horrible over there. But not me, because I can preach. Not me, because I can sing. Not me. That's not by the way you're known. <laughs> and so here they have this issue. And uh, this is, I'm telling you, this is where it's a novella. This is definitely a novella. For novella, for those that don't understand, a soap opera. <laughs> and he says, not even, th this sexual morality is not even tolerated amongst the Gentiles. So in other words, the people in the world don't even tolerate this. A man is sleeping with his father's wife, Maria. ¿Por qué tú te pusiste con el esposo de Maria? You know, it's like, like that's a straight, like, right there. I need you to capture that. That's what happens in Spanish soap operas, Pastor Todd. They're real overdramatic. <laughs> ¿Por qué? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> and then they come back next week where you're like, oh, what happened? <laughs> and so a man is sleeping with his father's wife, and he says, and you're arrogant. So not only he said, hey, sexual morality, he says, and you're arrogant. So all my arrogant folks out there. Shouldn't you be filled with grief? It's good stuff. Shouldn't you be filled with grief and remove from your congregation the one who did this? Like, shouldn't you be filled with grief and remove? You're thinking like, what? That's so mean. Oh, we would get so offended if I walked up to you on a Sunday and I go, hey, what's going on? You, you know, I mean, I love you, but you have one sleeping with multiple people. And, you know... Just come back when you're serious about this. Good game. 
we think, what? But that's what it says there. Even though I'm asking in the Bible, I'm present in spirit. As one who is present with you in this way, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who has been doing such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and I am with you in spirit, with the power of the, our Lord Jesus. No, this is good. He said, when I roll up, <laughs> when you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and I am with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, because that's where you get all the power to, to love. The flesh has to die for the resurrection to happen. Right? He says, hand that one over to Satan. For the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Now, now, now I don't know how you read that. When I, when I first read it, I said, ooh, we don't teach this enough. So you know I read it, and I like just, I, when I see something like that, I'm like, man. Because we're like, Lord, you know, help him, bring him to church, Lord. Help him, help him see, Lord. That's not what he bring. He don't unbutton the jacket. He said, Lord, be acting a fool, Lord. Give him over to Satan. Let him get whooped. Bring him to his knees, Lord. Let him get slapped around by Satan. Let him have his weight. Remove the hedge of protection. Let him get whooped so that he might be saved in the last day. Ooh, look, at some of you want to go home and pray that right now. I, I'm thinking the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to send 1 Corinthians 5, 5 to my kids. And go, if you act wrong, you got one week. <laughs> and then, and then when it gets closer to that prayer, I'll go in five, four. We good. We're there. I'm sorry. <laughs> see, because, see, there, I, I love when I hear people say, oh, real, genuine. Like the best comment of all time. Because if you wind up in hell, it, it will never be because I didn't tell you the truth. It will never be because I was like, oh, you know, they're going to get mad at me. Like, it's, that's irrelevant. I didn't pick to do this thing. It picked me. So while I'm doing it, I'm going to tell you the truth. And so if you take today's, every message after last week's message, where it said to be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to get anger because that human anger doesn't produce the righteousness of God. If you take that and you apply it to that, that this week... We have this card we're going to give you. There's some of these cards that you could take about five, six, seven. Depends how many good deeds you're going to do this week. And then you have these random acts of kindness. Okay? Pay for someone behind you in line. Okay? Usually, this right here, um, we did it every year. Last year, I don't know what happened that we didn't get to do it. But I like this because usually when you do that, you tell the person, hey, could you give this to the next person? And so when they pick it up, they go... A little something extra to show you that God loves you. So Ruthie and I, we used to do it in IHOP, and then we'd give, say, hey, make sure you give this to the, give it to the waiter and make sure that, all right, bye, and we leave. And so they never knew who did it. They just know this. And sometimes it might be a person who wants to commit suicide. It may be a person who wants to make a, has to make a big decision. And so they get this, something extra to show you that God loves you. And they go, man, confirmation. Or they wind up at church or whether it's here or anywhere, right? Do something nice for your neighbor. Come on, there's a good opportunity. Some of you don't even know your neighbor. Oh, I'm scared. Listen, you weren't scared in the world. I'm telling you, it's like the, I know, like, it's like the cliche thing, but it's the truth. You, you, you talk to people you didn't know. When you were in the club, mm, 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 mm. You started talking to them. You didn't even know them. <laughs> hey, and they're like, hey, I'll take you home. You're like, okay. <laughs> but now you're like, I don't know if I could join a hangout. I'm nervous. I can't talk to people. I'm like, what happened to you? Where's, where's the boldness you had when you were in the world? Now all of a sudden you're like, oh, well, I don't know. I don't know about knocking on my neighbor's door. You did when you needed like <laughs> weed or something. Like you did that stuff. It's just trippy to me how, like, I, I'm telling you, I see gangsters, they come to Jesus, and they're like, I don't know. I'm like, you weren't like that in the world. <laughs> Pray for somebody at work. Oh, that's a good one. 
Because maybe your coworkers don't know that you have Jesus. They only know that you preach at them all the time. But they never see the actual actions. I think that's next week. It'll be fun. Invite your friends. Pray for somebody at work. Man, pray for them. Like, be like, hey, can I pray for you? Leave an extremely generous tip at your favorite restaurant. Everybody should be able to do that. That's America. And you know, it, I, I am a firm believer that when you do something in the name of God, like in the name of Jesus, like God takes care of you. But it has to really be, because he knows the hidden motive. But it, let's say you, you just lost your job, you had nothing. And you're like, man, I cannot, I don't even have $2. Then go the extra mile with somebody. That's your generous tip. Like go the extra mile. You see somebody groceries you're like let me but please tell them you're gonna help them with the groceries because nowadays they're like yo they're like back up you're like i'm just gonna help you with your groceries <laughs> it's, it's interesting that we have to say that today right surprise a family member with an unexpected gesture Ooh, that's my that's one of my favorites because sometimes your family all they know that you have jesus they're like yeah they're at church all the time they're this but they don't really see someone patient or someone kind They don't see that. They didn't see you go out of their way for them. There's some people you haven't talked to for a long time. You'll talk to them in the next funeral. Wouldn't it be good to make the phone call now? Hey, but they treated me mm -mm -mm, sacrificially and humility and with no conditions. See, because you're part. Then you leave it alone. I'm sure Peter and all them were tripping out when Jesus was still loving. Could you imagine being Judas? And he's still like, hey, eat with me. And you're thinking inside like, oh, man, I'm about to do this dude dirty. <laughs> and he's like, bring more bread. Oh, man. Like, it's got to be horrible. Right? Just think about it. Hugging you on the way out. Hey, here, and hold the money. <laughs> hold the money. Jesus, they would never be able to talk bad about Jesus. And they knew they were doing wrong. See, when I do my part, the person that knows they're doing wrong, that's between them and God now. I just do my part. People that talk about me, I love walking up to them and be like, hey. <laughs> I do. My wife will tell you. And extra, too. I see you across the room. I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, man, let me pray for you. How you been? Extra, too. Because at that point, you got to, I ain't doing it to be mean. I'm doing it, hey, I'm going to love you despite. And it bothers. It bothers. Like, you don't think I have the other guy inside me that wants to be like, what? <laughs> I don't care. I can't say it. It's hurt. You know, you don't think I get that feeling? Yeah, I got that feeling. I'd rather go the other way and be like, I know what you... But I can't no more, because I no longer live. It is he who lives in me. Right? <laughs> Call an old friend. Invite him to church. Hey, you know how you get in there. Yo, after church, I'm going to buy you some groceries. You knock out two in one shot. They're like, you're going to buy me groceries? Why? I just saw you need a little help. I got you. Amen? Everyone on your feet. If I get some prayer partners to come up to the front. Hey, there's going to be this thing that I'm doing. I don't know. I, I just thought about it this week. You know, I felt like the Lord had impressed it on my heart. There's a few things I want to do. And so we did it last year. We're in December. We called some people up and we blessed them. And so I want you to live above, you know, your tide. This is above your tide. And so you got October and November to do it as many times as you want. There's this thing on the app. It's called Crazy Generosity. Okay? In the past, I think, I forgot what number we're on. Maybe 15 cars, 16 cars. I don't remember. But that's how we did it. Okay? Everybody would put in $40. If you could put more, you put more. Whatever the Lord puts in your heart. And so we, we, rate, we gather it together and then we've blessed people. So this year I feel like 
there's just some things, you know, the Lord has pressed on my heart. Right? So we want to be a generous church. I just don't want to read about acts and stuff. I want to share with people that sometimes there's just people go through stuff and they've just been, um, they've been faithful. And so we want to make sure that, you know, who the Lord puts in our heart. And I felt like the Lord did that. And so, you know, from now, you put it in the crazy generosity. You put that separate. And at the end, we're going to tally it up and you'll see what happens with it. I think last year we gave it to a few nonprofit organizations. This, this year, I think there's some needs that need to be met. Amen? You're like, man, I don't know if I could do that. Yeah, sure. You get $40 at Starbucks all the time. All the time. And they ain't really doing nothing. They're just feeding you more coffee. And it's the truth. We, we complain about the God things, but we, we really want to see God move in people's lives. Amen? And so you go to that crazy generosity and you put there whatever. If you're here and you're a multimillionaire, buy us the land. Just in case. I figure I have to say it. I just felt it right here. I just felt it. Keep us in prayer as we're talking to a bank, we're doing all this stuff, really believing. Could you imagine? Just imagine with me. So we have the sanctuary or the auditorium, right? We, have, we want to have houses for men and women that come out of prison, Amen. baseball field to bring in the community. We want a house. It's going to be called the family first house. And let me tell you what this house is going to do. Let's say you're at the church and you're going through a season where you're struggling. So it'll be like 60 days, 120 days, a year. It depends who you are. And you'll be able to live in this house. But you'll have to do what we tell you. Financial class, whatever classes we tell you to go to. And so we'll get you back on your feet. But this time we'll also give you tools to actually do it. So this is kind of what we want to do. I, don't, I never wanted to be a church just to be big and be like, oh, and I'm not saying nothing against big churches. I'm just saying. I wanted to be a church that even the people from the street that don't go to church are like, man, we love them. Real recognize real. You say that all the time, right? Okay, so even if they don't come, they'll be like, man, there ain't nothing bad we can say about them. They give toys to my kids. And I believe God's going to do it. I saw 47 acres for 1.2 million, just in case to be exact, in case you're out there. <laughs> and then right past me. So a couple of other properties. We could buy two or three. And then the world will say, that's crazy. And we'll say, <laughs> y'all are tracking with me. I want you to close your eyes for a moment. Don't just think about this as a Sunday service, you know. Think about this as the day you came and Jesus spoke to your heart. I want you to say, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. what are you saying to me? Do the people closest to you see Jesus? Do you reflect the love of Christ? Are you known? But maybe that, oh, he does a lot of church. Or are you known by the way you love? And I've been teaching this church, you don't wait till somebody moves. If you feel a tug for prayer, I want you to come right up quickly and pray for somebody. Why? Because you want to move by faith. You feel the tug, don't sit there. Just come get prayer. Why? Because there'll be another season where you'll be in your car or somewhere and God's going to tug and you're going to need to move. And you come and you just ask someone to pray with you and be open, vulnerable, and honest. It's a safe place. And let them touch and agree with heaven in you. I believe in the laying of the hands. I believe in prayer. Maybe it's a family member you're about to call and you just need the prayer. <laughs> but make this week about some incredible change. Let somebody see something different. Exercise a different muscle that you thought you never had before. And I guarantee you that when you draw near to Christ, He draws near to you. Amen. God bless y'all.